the In Conversation podcast series with author Nigel Beckles. Welcome to the podcast. podcast. Please like the podcast, podcast. and subscribe podcast. to this channel. Podcast. Thank you. Podcast. Have you experienced several failed relationships or been through a divorce? How can you avoid making the same mistakes again? How to avoid making the big relationship mistakes is out now. Hi, my name is Nigel Beckles. My new book is packed with practical and common sense strategies that you can use to make better relationship choices. Now you can discover the dangerous myths about love. If your relationship expectations are realistic, why you could be falling in love for all the wrong reasons. How to avoid making the big relationship mistakes. It's a book that could change your life. Available from Amazon.co.uk. Kindle version also available. The very best way to promote your podcasts. Podpage makes it easy to create a podcast website with just a few clicks. Every page is optimized to be found on Google and it stays up to date forever. For more information visit podpage.com. The future of podcast promotion. Get ready for takeoff. Welcome back to my In Conversation podcast series. In this episode, we continue with part two of the Men and Relationships mini-series with former R&B artist, father and husband, American JC. Greetings, Jay. Welcome to my podcast series. How are you? I'm blessed, man. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. So you're in the USA, so whereabouts do you live? Bay Area. When people think of the Bay Area, they think of San Francisco, so I just say the San Francisco Bay Area. So did you grow up in that area? Yep, yep, been here all my life. Okay, and what was it like? What was your childhood like? Childhood growing up, I didn't really have much of a child, (laughs) childhood. You know, I had to grow up really fast. But as far as being a kid in the Bay Area, it was fun, man. You know, we're, we're close to Disneyland. The average theme park is nice. You mentioned growing up fast. Why do you believe you had to grow up fast? Oh, man. Um, you know, growing up, I didn't know who my dad was for, for some years. And when I found out who my dad was, I was told that wasn't my dad. And then, then when I found out that it was my dad, it took a long time for me to be comfortable with him. You know, so a lot of it was my mom made a lot of uh, emotional choices when it came to her love interest. You know, I'm I'm African American and Filipino, so you can imagine a four foot nine Filipino woman uh, dating these, you know, six foot five, six foot two. My dad is six two, but these black guys and and where I come from, they're it's really rough, the real street life. At an early age, you watch your mom's heart get broken over and over and over again. But the man she married, he was very uh, abusive, uh, in and out of jail all the time, in and out of prison all the time. I said in one of my podcast episodes that at a young age, I believe about eight years old, six, six years old, I'm sorry, prison guards knew me by name. And I had a favorite prison guard because I was at the prison all the time. I was at the prison so frequently. And the guy that my mom married, I was being told was my dad. So for a long time, I was confused, you know, if this was my dad or if this was my dad, but my biological father wasn't always physically in the picture. He was trying to build a relationship slowly while going against the grain, while my mom's telling me, that's not your dad, this is your dad, but she's still allowing this man to come around and pick me up for ice cream. And and, and mind you, he lived three hours away at the time. So when he would come, he would just come for like an ice cream date and then drop me back off. And that was awkward in itself, you know, because now I feel like I'm being forced to go. But then a part of me wants to go because he's nicer than the guy that I'm being told is my dad. There was a lot of confusion. I was I was immediately labeled a surrogate husband for my mom because when her boyfriend or when she even got, she eventually got married, her husband wasn't around. I was always the one that took the emotional stress from her. I knew I knew every uh, soap opera on TV. You know, she would tell me about everything that was going on. She would tell me about everything going on at work. Things that a wife should be able to come home and basically dump on her husband to relinquish the stress of the day. That was me at like four and a half to on. And uh, as soon as I could understand. And then I immediately had this feeling like I need to protect her at all costs. So being in martial arts, I was always fighting. Anybody would say anything about my mom. It was on and popping. You know what I mean? And even down to the men, it, which is funny because you get these grown men asking this little kid, because she always used to say, oh, you got to ask my son to date me, right? At first, it's cute because, you know, it's like, hey, little man, can I date your mom? And I'm like, hey, F you, you know? <laughs> and they're like, oh, that's cute, you know? But then that little boy kind of grows up 
and then he gets some muscles, he gets a little bass in his voice, and now it's no longer cute, it's threatening. And so I've actually had to square face, square face to face with a couple of her boyfriends. And she liked it, you know, she, she liked being protected, you know, she, and eventually when this event happened in my life, she bragged about it. Oh, you know, he's, he did this and now he's here. If you mess with me, he'll come out and, you know, <laughs> you know, so she already put me in a bad light to these men. Yeah. So having to grow up quick is honestly an understatement. And then having sisters having to be their father because her father wasn't around and then having to learn how to be a gentleman because I don't want them to grow up like our mom. Well, I certainly resonate with you in terms of uh, protecting your mother because I was brought up in a home where there was domestic violence and Mm. I had to protect my mother at a very young age. And I also became obsessed with martial arts. I mean, in my bedroom at the time, when I was maybe, you know, 10, 11, 12, it was just Bruce Lee pictures. You (laughs) You could not see wallpaper. Obviously, it impacts you, that whole experience. And what I also found growing up was when there's domestic violence present, it's a very uncertain environment. You're Mm. never quite sure what's going to happen next. Yeah, definitely. So you mentioned your podcast earlier. Why were you inspired to begin your podcast, which is called Hashtag Dad? Hashtag Dad Swag. So it almost didn't happen, I'll say that, because I didn't feel like I was the man that I was trying to describe in the podcast, right? And um, I had got injured. I have a musical background and uh, I felt like, you know, I needed to pursue music. I needed to pursue music at all costs. But at one point doing music the way I was doing it really hurt my family. You know, living that, uh, I I sing R&B. So living that R&B crooner life, you know, I I just leave it, (laughs) leave it at that. And trying to, trying to hold on to something that uh, I felt defined me. And in my podcast, I talk about white walls. And when I talk about white walls, I say in the effects that every time God wants to get get my attention, he sits me in front of a white wall. And not figuratively, literally, (laughs) he sits me in front of a white wall. To elaborate a little bit, when my first son was born, he was born with leukemia and Down syndrome. And uh, I wasn't there for any of it. I was in prison. I don't want to say a, a thug life. And I don't mean it in the sense of the pop culture, best life. I mean, I wasn't living right, right enough for, for God, I, I would say, to, to become the father that I needed to be today. So I went to prison and I was sitting in front of White Wall, you know, and I, I really heard God say, do you want to be a father? Or do you want to keep being foolish? And for a minute, I tried to, I tried to fool God. You know, I tried to say, oh yeah, I'm ready to be a dad. You know, I'm ready to get out of here. But um, I, I won't ramble too much about religion, but it's a very big part of, you know, who I am as a father. And I do believe that God judges the inside. So you can't fool God because he already knows your inside, you know? And for me, when I say, you know, oh yeah, I'm ready to be a father. He's looking at me like, no, you're not, but we're going to get you ready and we're going to test you. And so while I was in prison, I found out my son had cancer. Then I had, then he had down syndrome. So I felt like a whole shift had to happen mentally and emotionally and spiritually for him to say, okay, you're ready. Let's open up these doors, you know? And so when he opened up these doors, I felt like, okay, I know what I need to do. And had I not made that mindset, I would have went back to doing what I was doing before I got locked up. When I made that mindset, I got out and I did everything legally, ethically, and morally to provide for my family. So I say all that because I've been providing ever since I've been home, right? And I started, I started getting to a place mentally and emotionally where I was complacent in my position as a father. I'm very involved. I love my kids. I love my wife. I'm, I'm very devoted. I'm very committed. But there's sometimes levels of complacency that kind of creep in that start to become threatening. And I was hurt really bad. Broke my, I was run over, broke my leg, broke my ankle. I was bedridden. Again, I'm, in a, I'm looking at a white wall in my room now. <laughs> there goes a white wall. And I'm looking at this white wall. And mind you, this happened five days before the coronavirus shut down. So not only am I not able to make the money that, I'm, that I was making that held my status again, right? Every time I've gotten to a status and I've gotten too big headed, you know, whether it be making money or whether it be going on tour or on stage or whatever the case may be, God's had to bring me down to reality and sit me in front of a white wall, <laughs> you know? And for me, I'm looking at this white wall and I'm questioning myself, like, what good are you now? What good are you now? You don't make money. Nobody's calling you boss. Your, your wife is downstairs. You can't even go to the store for her. 
And if something happens to her outside with the paper, uh, the toilet paper snatchers, <laughs> then you'll never know, you know, and even if you know, you'll get a phone call. And what are you going to do? You can't get up. So I started really having to look at myself and figure out who am I as a man? Who am, what defines me? I'm not a boss. You know, I'm not a singer. That doesn't define me. What defines me? And that's when the podcast really started because I, I needed I needed answers. I had more questions than I had answers. And, you know, hashtag that's why I guess the concept of it is you don't need to wear, <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't need to wear cargo shorts and, and New Balance sneakers to be an, an active father. You know, that's the, that's the picture when you think of active father these days, right? I have piercings, you know, I have tattoos. I'm the youngest um, father um, at my son's school with a child with Down syndrome, you know, but I'm the most involved. So the narrative and the stigma between what a involved father is needed to change, you know, and I felt like uh, there were people who I could reach out to and I can provide some information. And we, we get on this concept of iron sharp and iron where I help you and you help me. So hashtag dad spike is basically my diary, man. You know, it's, <laughs> that, that's all it is. It's basically my diary for the world to see. And hopefully I get a response in the sense of advice and support because that's what I'm offering. Well, we were talking about our respective childhoods. What impact do you think it has on certain young men or boys for that matter in terms of how they're brought up? We all have our own set of challenges, right? In your childhood, even if you grew up with the silver spoon, chances are you probably had a parent that was working really hard, was maybe not in the house as much because they were trying to provide. If you grew up the way I grew up, then you grew up asking the car behind you in the McDonald's to drive through for a couple of dollars because you realize your mom didn't have enough to pay for the Happy Meal. So I think having kids of my own now, I can't let the way I grew up affect the way they grew up. It's a choice, right? And I, I say it in the podcast too, that there's a thin line between comfort and complacency. And that line is called effort. You know, effort determines either you're going to or you're not going to. In your relationship, even you're a relationships expert. So maybe you can appreciate this. Like I say that because when you stop noticing your wife who did her hair, when you stop bringing roses or you stop just kissing her and letting her know that you love her, you know, just because not because it's a, a holiday, not because it's an anniversary or, you know, a special occasion. That's when the questions start coming up. Are we OK? Do you love me still? You know, are we am I still enough for you? It's because she doesn't feel noticed. So you've gotten to a place where you're complacent, where you don't feel like you have to do those things anymore. Comfortability is being able to deter my, to take a detour from my route to work and hop over to the nearest Safeway, grabbing some roses and <laughs> presenting them to my wife just because it's Tuesday, just because it's Wednesday, you know, and that keeps your, that keeps the effort going. That keeps her feeling like she's appreciated. When we're growing up as kids, when I was growing up as a kid, I never experienced that. So I had to make a choice early on that the pain that I was watching my my mother go through, that the pain that I was going through physically and emotionally, that my family, when I had one, wouldn't go through the same thing. So basically, I have a blueprint. I have a cheat sheet. The cheat sheet is I have all the wrong answers. Now I just need to do the right answers, you know? And it's only an A and B question, you know? <laughs> it's, I already seen A. I need to do B. So, and whatever B entails, I think we embody we, you know, that's why people say, you know, I'm a product of my environment. That just doesn't mean your outside environment. That's more so your internal environment, because that's the environment you're, you're around more, right? So if you grow up in an abusive household, chances are generational curses that tell you that you're going to be an abusive man, you know, an alcoholic, you're going to, you're going to, you may fall into alcoholism, pedophilia, all, all these things, you know, are, they trickle down somehow through the generations, right? We call them generational curses. A lot of people don't understand that concept, but it's a choice for you to break those generational curses. It's a choice for you to make the decision to be different from what you experienced so that your your family can experience something better. Well, some would call it generational curses. Another way to look at it would be learned behavior. Mm. If you're brought up in that type of environment, observing those type of behaviors, you may consider that normal because you don't have the maturity or experience to know any better you can just fall into that pattern absolutely and and eventually you become you become comfortable in the chaos you become comfortable in the pain so when you're not feeling those things you self-sabotage right you look for the chaos and if you can't find it you create it so it's all 
about your mental makeup and your your mental wellness, your mental health, because you have to be mentally strong to say, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm not going to right now I've become a new stay at home dad. My wife went to work full time. So to some that could seem emasculating, but I feel blessed that I have a wife that is willing and able to not only pick up the slack, but have the skill set to financially keep us where we were. You know, uh, that doesn't offend me. What offends me the most is that I'm not the one doing it. That's my pride. That's my, uh, that's my ego speaking. I try to justify by saying it's just because I want to provide. No, it's because I don't want my status as a, a hardworking father. Again, it comes back to status. And again, it comes back to these damn white walls right? where I'm sitting here and I'm like, even as I speak to you now, I have to look up and I'm looking at a white wall because I'm saying to myself, it's my pride, it's my pride. And then boom, there's another white wall. I'm looking at this thing and I'm just like, you're right. You know, I, I have to, I have to let go of that. These gender roles and, you know, the gender norms, they're, they're no more. You know, I do believe in some tradition. I do believe in what the head of the household is, but you have to earn that. There's the difference, right? You can't just call yourself the head of the household because now on paper, I'm no longer the head of the household. So I need to head my household by leading them in the most positive and, and productive way possible as a father. My wife has to know that just as I was taking care of things with my nine to five, I'll be taking care of things as equally or better in my 24 seven as a, as a stay at home dad, you know, and that I won't miss a beat, you know, and just like she, she won't miss a beat. It's a transition period that we're going through right now. But at the same time, as parents, it's, it's the transition period that has been put on us. Me not going to work isn't intentional. It's circumstantial. And I have to understand that if it's intentional, that's where the head of the household title kind of becomes up in the air, <laughs> you know, where it's like, well, you don't want to provide. And that's an issue for me personally. That's an issue. If you don't want to provide, that's all you're called to do for your kids and for your wife is provide, provide the best life that you can. It, you know, it doesn't have to be riches and, you know, it doesn't have to be luxury. When I was in the music industry, I was doing this because I wanted luxury. I'm at peace because now I'm doing a podcast because now it's for legacy. Kids are going to look back at this and say, wow, you know, this is something that I can be proud of dad for, as opposed to looking at some of my old records and saying, wow, he disrespected mom <laughs> in this song. You know, he was talking about a strip club and never been to a strip club. You know, he was talking about, you know, sleeping with this woman and this woman. And did he sleep with that woman and this woman? You know, and um, that's just that's not the, the legacy that I want to leave for my kids. So why do you believe many guys struggle to express their emotions? And I ask the question because when I look at the research across the world, men are likely to commit suicide more mm. than women. In fact, the stats tell me that men commit suicide two thirds more than women. Yeah. And I believe that's partly due to men struggling to express their emotions. So why mm -hmm. do you think men do struggle with expressing themselves? Again, it's another it's another narrative that we've been we become accustomed to. It trickles down from the seventies. There was no TV, there was no Instagram, there was no Facebook or any of these social media outlets, right? So there was no reason to stay in the house all day and they were out being active. They were told not to show weakness. And then as the generations go on, a little more weakness is shown, a little more weakness is shown, it becomes a little more acceptable. But I still feel like we're not supposed to show that weakness. And that is a narrative we have to change because, you know, like you said, the, the suicide rate, especially during COVID, is skyrocketing. Some people only looked forward to work because it was getting out of their house. And now, especially with domestic abuse even, right, we, we go back to domestic abuse. Domestic abuse has skyrocketed, I think, like 200%, you know, 697,000 cases reported, something like that, in, at least in, in, the, in the U.S. since April like 38,000 deaths. And it's one in four women, one in 10 men, right? So, and the one in 10 men are in a, I forget the statistic exactly, but a lot of them are from a same-sex uh, relationship. So it's still a, a man beating on another man and then a man beating on a woman. We believe that we're supposed to be dominant. And then when we feel like we're not dominant, we become emasculated there's that word again emasculated and then when we become emasculated we're no longer in control you know we feel less of a man so we need to feel like we're in control of something so therefore we result to violence or we result to suicide because we don't feel control of our own destiny at the time and it's only a split second suicide isn't a, a 
a long drawn out process. I went through so much in my life that I was actually 5150 back in high school. I was put in a hospital for a month and uh, it wasn't a long drawn out process. It was me going through what I was going through and then finally making the decision that I wanted to end it. You know, it wasn't like, you know, I, you know, I didn't cut myself or anything. I was far more uh, <laughs> quick with it. You know, I, I wanted, I wanted to end it all quick. And uh, I brought a gun to school and went to the bathroom, the gun jammed. So the doctor, the, the resource officer found me uh, in the bathroom and the history is, is the history. But again, at 65% of children who commit suicide are fatherless homes, have fatherless homes. And, um, uh, when you don't have a man to say, I love you, when you don't have a man to say, I'm here for you, or you can talk to me, because he didn't have that, that is what's hurting us as men, because we don't believe we have an outlet. We don't feel like we can talk to our wives because we don't want to show weakness. And then you don't want to feel like you can talk to a man because you don't want to seem weaker than he is. This pride and this ego thing is really hurting us. But at the same time, we don't understand that crying out for help is okay. We don't understand that not being okay is okay. And saying that we're not okay is the difference between life and death. And so I encourage men, definitely. Um, that's why I started Hashtag That's Why. If you are feeling that way, if you're feeling like there's no outlet for you, use me as an outlet. I'm here. And this podcast, it's not just a podcast and I turn it off at the end of the day. My phone number, my, my email, my DMs, thanks to the power of social media, they're all accessible. And I answer back quick. I, I don't take all day. And, and I'm willing to listen to you. Just reach out before you make that choice. So, Jay, what are your plans for the future? What's on your bucket list? A bucket list. I'd like to eventually, well, as far as the podcast goes, I'd like to um, syndicate the podcast. I think that that'd be pretty awesome. Uh, syndicated across the, you know, the nation with, some, with, a, with a few uh, prominent radio stations. I, I want this to be out there as much as possible. I want this mission. I want this goal to be a common goal amongst men that we need to be more involved as fathers. And if you don't have the tool set to be an active and involved father, then there are outlets out there that can help you pull from. My favorite tagline, like I said, is iron sharpens iron. And what that means if people who don't understand that is back in the medieval times, a spinning wheel of iron would sharpen a sword for war, right? Or for battle. Well, some days I'm the sword and you're the spinning wheel. And other days, I'm the spinning wheel and you're the sword. We need to sharpen each other. We need to understand that there is a bad narrative surrounding fatherhood that we're not involved. Look up uh, fatherless movies or movies about fatherlessness. And then look up movies about um, motherlessness. The, <laughs> the media even portrays it, that it, it's a problem. And, and we've been so blind to it because it's such a, a normal thing to see that it's just like, oh, it's just another movie. But no, it's, this is you. As a father, you should feel offended that that's a movie. Because even though that's the truth, that's not the whole truth. And we need to be able to to get that that truth out there. So uh, if I can get syndicated, uh, um, I would love that. Uh, more so, I I'm looking into right now, speaking at uh, juvenile detention centers. I kind of want to move into public speaking. Not necessarily motivation, but definitely if I can do it, you can do it kind of stuff. But more so just telling my story and saying, these are the these are the end results this doesn't have to be your result uh you can change your life right now even though you're in the the position that you're in you can change your life right now even with fatherhood even though you're you may feel like a bad father now you can change that you still got time but you got to do it before it's it's too late i eventually want to move to public speaking and i hope one day to write a book i hope one day to write a book i think my wife and i we have such a crazy backstory of how we had our child and the things that she went through her perspective of you know dealing with a, a son with down syndrome and and leukemia and chemotherapy and also dealing with you know a boyfriend who is locked away in prison it's just for me that's the teen mom story that i want to watch <laughs> you know not not what's on the tv now that's a real teen mom story in the sense of there is tragedy and triumph in that. So I definitely want to uh, move forward with those things. And how long have you been married to your wife? I've been married six years together, 12. So Jay, how can people contact you? Yeah. Um, all my social media sites, um, hashtag dad swag on Facebook, hashtag dad swag at gmail.com. You hashtag dad swag on TikTok. <laughs> you know, we do, we do videos with the kids now and on IG all these ways to contact me and I answer all of them. So reach out. JC in the USA. Thank you very much for your time. Nigel, my man, I appreciate you. Thank you.
Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe. Another in conversation podcast coming soon.